Welcome everyone. I want to thank the REXIS organizing committee for inviting me to present my research today. My name is Lucia Peixoto. I'm an assistant professor at the College of Medicine at Washington State University. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about understanding the interaction between sleep and chromatin regulation in autism. My lab studies autism spectrum disorder, which is an umbrella term to describe a group of developmental disabilities that are diagnosed based on two core diagnostic symptoms. One is deficits in social communication and the other one is re excess restricted or repetitive behaviors. Right now, one in 44 children in the United States will be diagnosed on the spectrum, making it the most prevalent neurodevelopmental disability in this country. In a lab, we try to focus on factors that impact quality of life for both individuals and their caregivers, and one of the factors that we study is sleep, more specifically insomnia. Insomnia is pervasive in ASD. Up to 93% of individuals have insomnia, which is defined by a delayed sleep onset, sleep fragmentation, which then leads to reduced sleep time. Insomnia can predict how severe the ASD core symptoms are. We also know that poor sleep has adverse effects on cognition, attention, and emotion regulation, things that individuals on the spectrum have challenges with. And there's some recent research that has shown that insomnia symptoms can precede the ASD diagnosis and can be associated with altered patterns of brain development. However, the cause of insomnia and the consequences of sleep deprivation in autism are poorly understood. So what is sleep? Sleep is an evolutionary conserved behavioral state. You're probably familiar with it. And we use four criteria to define sleep. It is a state of sustained quiescence, a reduced responsiveness to external stimuli by quickly reversible. But one of the most important features of sleep is that home is homeostatically regulated, meaning that your body will try to recover it when you lose it. The biological function of sleep remains a mystery, even though we have a lot of hints of what it is important for. How do we measure sleep in mammals? We measure sleep as a brain state. And we do that by measuring brain electrical activity. Broadly speaking, your brain has three states. One is being awake, and, and then there's two different states of sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, and that's the slow oscillation, deep sleep, and rapid eye movement sleep, which looks very similar to wake on the EEG, and that's usually when you dream. We can also measure how sleepy you are on AEG, and this is an example of a baseline recording from a mouse on slow wave sleep when it's undisturbed, and exactly the same mouse after it's been sleep deprived or kept awake for a while. And what you can see is that the sleep, the amplitude or the power in the delta range is larger. And this means that the mouse is trying to sleep deeper to recover the sleep it lost. So in my talk today, I'm gonna first quickly walk you through work that we have done in the lab to define a mouse model with what we call construct and phase validity to study insomnia and ASD. We needed to define a mouse model because we wanted to take the brain out and then use genomic approaches to understand the adverse consequences of sleep loss. So what do we mean by construct and phase validity? Construct means that we have a biological construct in a mouse that is equivalent to a human. For example, a mutation on the same gene. While phase validity means that we have clinical behavioral outcomes that are the same. When I started my lab, there's plenty of mouse models with construct validity for ASD, but there wasn't a single mouse model that had phase validity for insomnia. So we decided to start working on a mouse model with mutations on a gene called SHANK3. SHANK3 is associated with ASD, meaning it has construct validity in two different ways. SHANK3 deletion is causal of a genetic syndrome called Phelan McDermott syndrome. And if you have Phelan McDermott syndrome, you have an 80% rate of diagnosis on the spectrum. In addition to that, individuals with idiopathic ASD, meaning an ASD that cannot be traced to a genetic disorder, we can find one to 2% of those individuals have point mutations in this gene. What is this gene? 
this gene is a really large structural scaffolding protein that is best known for its role at what we call excitatory synapses. So in the brain, the cells that do most of the work in storing information and responding to experience are the neurons. We have two different kinds of neurons, excitatory neurons, which are the ones that usually transfer information over long distances, and Shen3 anchors synaptic receptors at the post synapse, so the receiving end of the information from another neuron. In addition to that, we have inhibitory neurons that inhibit the input of the excitatory neurons. So this is a very important protein and is best known for its role at the synapses. So when we started this work, we first wanted to ask the question whether individuals with Phila-McDermott syndrome had the same type of sleep problems that were reported on the spectrum in general. And we did that by collecting data uh, through a community partnership with the Phila-McDermott syndrome foundation. And we basically asked individuals with a confirmed genetic diagnosis, confirmed mutation of CHAG3, whether they had difficulty falling asleep, multiple night awakenings, or reduced sleep time. This has been published about three three years ago, so I'm going to quickly go through it, but basically what we also did at the same time is use a meta-analysis of literature to estimate the prevalence of these three problems in typically developing individuals as well as individuals on the spectrum, and what you see here is just frequency of individuals that have either difficulty falling asleep, multiple night awakenings, or reduced sleep time. And you can see that the individuals with Philip McDonald's syndrome have very similar prevalence than individuals with ASD in general. We then use a mouse model with a deletion in Shank 3 and there's a deletion of the C terminus of Shank 3 And the reason we chose that particular model is because the majority of point mutations in idiopathic ASD actually cause C terminal truncation. And we briefly showed that these mice have all the features of the clinical insomnia feature, meaning they sleep less, and they have fragmented sleep, and they have problems falling asleep. So I'm going to very slowly walk you through those features and how we measure them. So what we have here in is the amount of recording time in the EG that this animal spent in non-rapid eye movement sleep, which is the majority of your sleep, always in our graphs. In red, we have Shank 3 mutants. In black, we have wild type brothers, and these are all males. We have done this experiment with females too. In here, you have the light period. Mice are nocturnal, so they sleep mostly during the night. And the dark period is when they're most active. Mice are not active during the whole night. They usually are active the first part of the night, and then they take a siesta. And what you can see here is that this mice the mutants sleep a lot less after they've been awake for a while. In here, in, in here, the other thing that we have, which was something that has not been described before, is the amount of power in the delta frequency range. And as I told you at the beginning, how deep your sleep is can be measured by the power in the low frequency. And what we shown here is that the mutant mice have a lot less power in, in, in the delta range. This means they the quality of the sleep is reduced. Uh, a year after we published this, this was actually validated in clinical populations and in ASD in general. So this is actually an important feature of the phenotype. And the other thing that we can do here is we can actually measure the, the bout duration. So how long in minutes do they spend in non-REM sleep before micro-awakening again? And if your sleep is fragmented, your bout duration is reduced. And you can see here that when the amount of sleep is reduced, then the bowel duration is reduced. So this is a sign of sleep fragmentation. Then we challenge the mice by keeping them awake for five hours. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in a couple of slides. And all that we were measuring is if we make the mice tire, how long it takes them in minutes to fall asleep. And you can see the, the mutants in red have a substantial delay in falling asleep. This happens in the absence of differences in accumulating delta power, right? So they have basal delta power that is lower, but they are still able to respond by trying to sleep deeper if they're tired. So this means they're tired. So this is what we call a paradoxical response to sleep deprivation. So now we had the model, and, and now we wanted to explore the relationship between autism and insomnia, which in a way is a little bit of a chicken and an egg question. Does insomnia cause autism? Does autism cause insomnia? 
I'm not gonna talk about the causal developmental work that we've been doing, but I'll be happy to talk about it to anyone that is interested. And this comes to the regulation of sleep as you develop or as you grow older in infants and toddlers. But the other, the question that we really wanted to ask is, does autism worsen the negative consequences of insomnia? And what we thought that was gonna be the case is because if you look at insomnia in general and you look at the autism phenotype and how early it presents in terms of age, it seems that they, that having autism really does worsen the consequence of insomnia. So in order to answer that question, we decided to use some genomic approaches in mice to try to understand the adverse consequences in sleep loss. But before we could actually go into ask the question in our model, we really needed to understand what happened in neurotypical conditions. So let me talk about that for a little bit. So in general, our experimental design for this type of experiments to try to understand the detrimental effects of sleep deprivation in gene expression and gene expression regulation looks like this. We have mice that we keep awake for five to six hours. We call that the sleep deprivation condition. We do that by gently brushing their fur with a paintbrush when they're about to fall asleep. This is called gentle handling, and this has been shown not to be stressful. It does increases cortisol, but it does not increase cortisol above a sort of a regular exploratory physiological task. And that is very important because using a different method uh, of sleep deprivation can be very stressful, and then you don't know if, if what you're seeing is the response to the lack of sleep or the response to stress. The other thing that we can do is then we can allow them to recover sleep for two hours, six hours, how many hours we want. So this is a very flexible way of manipulate expression. At the same time, we have uh, controls. We call them home cage controls. They are just sleeping in the home cage. But it is very important that we match them by time of day because time of day, circadian time, has a very strong influence in gene expression. In the rest of my talk, I'm only going to talk about five to six hours of sleep deprivation. But if you're interested in transcriptional dynamics, please go see Alex's poster. So I started working on the system when I was a postdoctoral fellow. So this is about my first paper about 10 years ago. And what we really wanted to know was whether sleep deprivation affected transcription in the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain that is best known for being essential for acquiring new memories. And uh, I had just joined the lab. I did my PhD in genomics and computational biology. I've never touched a mice. I knew nothing about neuroscience. And I was working with a very talented graduate student called Chris Vexi. And they had this problem. They have done this microarray. So this, this is a technology that many of you don't know about, but that's what I started with. And then he has done about 100 different qPCRs, and nothing will validate. So uh, we worked together, and I fixed the data. And meaning that all of a sudden, whatever I did when I actually analyzed the data, all his qPCRs replicated perfectly fine. And when we did that, we discovered that sleep deprivation inhibited the transcription of eukaryotic initiation factors, which then predicted that it will repress protein synthesis. And we went on to show that, in fact, it does rep repress mTOR signaling and 4-EVP, which then represses protein synthesis. And then a very talented postdoc in the lab that it, working with me and other people was able to then inject this 4-EVP and reverse the effects of sleep deprivation in learning memory. So what did we do? And we just normalized the data correctly. And that opened my eyes to how important it is to be able to remove the noise from the signal to try to discover the real biology underneath. And then I had a question, because a lot of people were doing microarrays after sleep deprivation in different parts of the brains, why were we the only ones seeing this effect on the repression of the expression of recreation factors and other factors involved in protein synthesis. So when I started my lab, I decided that I wanted to answer that question and find out if whether we had a gold standard for differential expression after sleep deprivation. 
and the experiment with design was the following. We used the hippocampus data that I just showed you about, then we collected data after sleep deprivation, also using microarrays in a different part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex does not mediate the acquisition of memory, but it, it, it mediates higher order executive functions and cognitive flexibility. And so our lab is, is represented by triangle symbols. And then we took data from published papers that were not able to report this effect on, on translational inhibition that were either the whole cortex or the whole brain. So each shape in here represents a microarray from a different lab. In orange, we have the home cage controls. In green, we have the sleep deprivation. And in addition, I went through the literature and I looked for positive controls or genes that have been replicated at least three independent times in the literature as being induced by sleep deprivation in a lot of different parts of the brain. So this is a principal component analysis plot in which after normalizing using RMA, which is the standard way of normalizing microarray data. And what you can obviously see is that the main driver of variability for this data is the lab or the platform. Everybody uses a different kind of microarray. And when you, if you try to do differential expression in this context, you obviously, your log full change versus log p-value looks like a pancake and you don't recover any of the non-positive controls from the literature. Then I use a method called RUV or remove unwanted variation, and this started a very long collaboration uh, with David Ariso, and I continue to work with him to this day. And after doing our UV normalization, we can actually separate in the principal component the effect of sleep deprivation, then our volcano plot looks much nicer. We can recover almost all of the positive control except one, which is right at the edge. So here in red, you have positive controls, and in blue, you have genes that are differentially expressed at an FDR of 0 0.05. And then we define a set of 562 genes that were responsive to sleep deprivation regardless of tissue. Okay. Then we wanted to obviously uh, use newer technologies. So since then, since 2016, we have undertaken a lot of work to try to understand exactly how, how sleep deprivation affects transcriptional regulation. And this is the broad experimental outline. We either allow the animal to sleep or we sleep deprive them. Then we take the tissue. We can take tissues of wild type animals. I'm gonna see in a little bit of the mutants. We can look at cortex and we can look at hippocampus. And we're doing two things in parallel. One is bulk RNA-seq and the other one is single nuclear RNA-seq. And the reason we're doing both in parallel is because both technologies have their benefits and, and they will give you different aspects of structural regulation. And the other idea is that we will want to look for consistency across the two technologies as a way to judge how accurate or how reproducible our analysis were. So this is the broad design of our sequencing experiment. And you know, biology is biology, regardless of technology, we should always be able to find an overlapping set of genes. This is broadly our data analysis pipeline. At this point, our bulk RNA-seq data analysis pipeline is, you know, pretty much set. We do a lot of quality control. We always normalize using our UV-seq and we do differential expression analysis. We rely heavily on Salmon and Bioconductor. And then we have been developing for the last year or so what we, uh, how we wanted to analyze our single nuclear RNA seq data. And sort of full disclosure, we are doing a cell annotation using a reference data set, the EOI et al. 2021, relying very heavily on the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network data. So we're not doing clustering for cell annotation. We're doing only transfer learning for cell annotation. And I'll be happy to talk about this. The bottom line is that before we tried this in our data set, uh, Elena Zuin, which is a student of David Ariso, actually shown that she, she's able to replicate the annotation from other data sets that were not the reference data set quite well using this approach. So let's first talk a little bit about bulk RNA-seq. This is just a traditional uh, volcano plot. And one of the things that we were able to do is validate the fact that about 
80% of those positive controls that we collected with our, our gold standard in our microarray study can be replicated in the prefrontal cortex when we do differential expression. Then we went on to look at differential transcript usage and differential transcript expression. And if you want to learn more about that, please go see Katie's poster. And then comes to the single nuclear NAC. And one of the things that we can see here, and I'm going to walk you through this slowly, is that we can very clearly see the effect of sleep deprivation in neurons in the prefrontal cortex. So uh, as I told you very briefly at the beginning, neurons can be broadly divided into two subtypes, the glutamatergic or excitatory neurons and the GABAergic or inhibitory neurons. In the cortex, the glutamatergic neurons are the ones that carry the information across different layers and to other parts of the brain. Well, they, so therefore they are defined by what are, which layer they are present and what they connect to, IT or PT means different tracks. Well, every layer has a subset of inhibitory neurons that are mostly defined by their gene expression patterns that inhibit the excitatory input. So what you have here in colors is the centroid of all the nuclei assigned to that cell type for each of the replicates. So for each color and each shape, you have three dots, three independent biological replicates. We are only using uh, cell types that we can, that for which we have at least 400 nuclei. And then in the shapes, you can see whether they were sleep deprived in a circle or they were allowed to sleep controls in the triangle. And this is a multidimensional scaling projection of variance uh, of our whole data set. What is really nice about this is that if you see in the MDS1, what you're seeing from left to right is the projection from glutamatergic to GABAergic cell types, meaning that one of the main drivers of variability in our data set is the cell type, which you will expect. But in MDS2, what you see is a very clear separation between the sleep deprived and the allowed to, uh, to sleep controls. So and then, and then, but you, you can also see if you look at the, the colors that are the same, is there's a huge variability between biological replicates. But we can use this and then we can go into each cell type and do pseudobulk analysis. If we now look at a subset of the cell types selected, and here what we're showing is the three most abundant glutamatergic cell types and the two most abundant GABAergic cell types, and we look at differential expression, you can see that the differences in expression by sleep deprivation are biased towards the excitatory or glutamatergic type. And that's true even when you have this approximately the same number of, of cells or nuclei detected. So for example, although you have a lot more somatostatin interneurons, GABAergic cell types detected, you see a much bigger effect of sleep deprivation in the glutamatergic neurons of LAV for 5 it in the cortex. Then we can then map the positive controls from that microarray data set, and we can see that we can detect quite a bit of them even though we can only detect about 300 of the 562 that we originally defined based on how deep we're sequencing. We did the same thing for the hippocampus, and this is just shortly showing some of the results. Even though the hippocampus has a very different cell type composition, it has a very small number of GABAergic uh, inhibitory neurons, we still see that bias towards excitatory types. In particular, in the hippocampus, we see a very strong bias of this, the effect of sleep deprivation towards the CA1 dorsal parameter glutamatergic neurons. But overall now, we have a very good idea of how sleep deprivation affects gene expression in the absence of any problem development or ASD mouse model. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to tell you what we've been doing with our mouse model. The first thing that we did is just look at bulk gene expression differences between mutants and wild types in response to sleep deprivation. This has been published. And overall, what we saw is that Shank 3 worsens the effect of sleep deprivation, more, mostly through transcriptional repression. Right? So there's a lot more genes differential expressed between mutants and wild types 
after you sleep deprived and the majority of them can be found in this cluster cluster one and in this heat map blue means down regulated while red means up regulated and you can see that for the most part the larger cluster of genes is blue in the mutants regardless of sleep deprivation but becomes even more blue after sleep deprivation. But when we look at those genes, we were expecting to, to find synaptic components because that, that's what we thought uh, that Shang-3 did. And all we found was transcription factors, mostly circadian transcription factors. And we were wondering why. But then when we went back to literature and we realized that our bias, that Shang-3 is only a synaptic protein, was actually quite wrong. Shang-3 has been shown to be what is called a synaptonuclear factor. It can move from the synapse to the nucleus in response to neuronal activation. And we went on to show um, in, in uh, different ways using proteomics that actually sleep deprivation increases nuclear Shang-3. So then we had the question, how can a large scaffolding protein like Shang-3 affect gene expression regulation? So a very small background here of the how gene expression is regulated through chromatin, something that a lot of you know a lot about, but briefly, obviously our DNA is packed inside the nucleus in order to be able to fit. It has different hierarchical uh, levels of organization that, are, uh, that basically make certain parts of your DNA more or less accessible. So in the end, you end up having a 3D genome architecture in which you have different compartments, A compartments being more open chromatin or B compartments being more closed chromatin. Within the open chromatin, you also have these loops called TADs, so topological associated domains. And that has been shown to be a 3D genome architecture changes has been shown to be very important in response to neural activation. They're important for learning a memory. They've been implied on complex brain disorders. So what we wanted to know is whether sleep deprivation change 3D chromatin architecture and whether our mutation actually had any effect. So in collaboration with the lab of Anna Pombo, we designed this particular experiment and we are using a technique called genome architecture mapping and, and a variation of this technique specifically called immunogam. So briefly, what we do is we have the mice in vivo, we either sleep deprived or not, we have mutants and wild types, and then you can narrow in in a tissue of interest. In this case, we were focusing in the CA1 of the hippocampus and in particular in the CA1 dorsal pyramidal glutamatory neurons, which we've shown carry a disproportional amount of the effect of sleep deprivation. After cryosectioning, those cell types were identified using uh, antibodies, and following laser microdissection, they are extracted for sequencing. So this is our design. We, ha we have four different conditions. Wild types either allowed to sleep in the home cage or sleep deprived, mutants allowed to sleep in the home cage or sleep deprived, and the data I'm gonna show you today is based, it has two independent biological replicas for condition, and I'm actually showing you the average of both conditions. Our GAM experiments show that there are changes in 3D genome topology across condition at different levels. So the data that we have here is a B compartment organization. A B compartment has been detected by PCA, as it's usually done on high C data. And in the right, here you have an upset plot showing the number of either B or A compartments in each condition. And as you can expect, because these are the same cell types, these are mice of the same age, the majority of B or A compartments are present in all conditions. However, you can see very specific patterns of differences. For example, in this, uh, dark red stars, you can see the changes that are only present, or either only a, switching from A to B, only in the Shank 3 Delta C home cage. And when you look at the genes that are in, the, in those compartments, the compartments that change, you actually see that there are genes enriched on ontologies such as synapse sonorization or structural constituent of the synapse, which is what you expect. You can also see in green, uh, the compartments that are changing specifically or in the wild type that after sleep deprivation, which are enriched on ERK1 or 2 cascade, and we know that sleep deprivation induces 
changes in, uh, in, in MAP kinase expression. The other level that we can look at is TAD boundaries. The way this is done is by just sliding this square of different sizes to try to determine the insulation heat map seen over here, darker mean more insulated. Once TAD boundaries are determined, we can just take a look at how many TAD boundaries are detected in each of the three conditions. Again, the majority of the TAD boundaries are detected in all conditions. However, we can detect patterns of differences. Again, here in green are the TAD boundaries that are only detected in the wild types after sleep deprivation, which are enriching gene ontologies such as glutamate receptor activity, glutamatergic synapse. That's what that means. Well, in dark red, we have the TAD boundaries only detected in the mutants under home cage conditions. And a lot of them are actually in rich ontologies for neurotransmitter and transport activity, but also chromosomal localization. So this is a very rich data set. Let me show you a specific example of changes in TAD boundaries across all the conditions with this, the NR1D1 locus. This is a transcription factor, a circadian transcription factor that we know by our bulk RNA-seq data is specifically being changed after sleep deprivation, but, but influenced by our mutation. So what you can see here in bright pink is the location of the NR1D1 locus. And you can see that in the wild types, there is no TAD boundary when they are sleeping. There's a faint boundary appearing after sleep deprivation, but there's a marked interaction between the mutation and sleep deprivation, which you see a very strong insulation signal here. And we know these genes get repressed. In, in summary, today I showed you that sleep deprivation causes large changes in gene expression that preferentially affect glutamatergic excitatory neurons. This is important because this implies it may alter something we call the E eye balance, the excitatory inhibitory balance, which is very important for brain function. Then using a mouse model to study insomnia in autism that we validated, I show you the Shank 3 Delta C mutation enhances the effect of sleep deprivation, and it seems that that effect is on transcriptal repression. And then I show you that both sleep deprivation and Shank 3 can influence 3D chromatin architecture on multiple scales. There's a lot of things going on in the future. Uh, we obviously want to integrate our GAM data with our single nuclear RNA-seq data. What I didn't tell you about is that the data was uh, collected in a multi-omic platform, so we also have single nuclear attack seq data. There's a lot of work to be done there. We also want to improve the detection of differential expression genes in single cell data. We know we can do better with our positive controls. And then we want to extend these approaches to characterizing how sleep deprivation affects transcriptal rep responses at younger ages through development, and also using auto mouse models of autism that we have in the lab now. I want to thank all members of my lab as well as all my collaborators and all the sources of funding, and I'll be happy to take any questions.